a good way to start. <laughs> well, hey, good morning, Jar family. So great to be with you all today. Like Chris said in the video, for those of you I haven't had the opportunity of meeting yet, my name is Nathan. I'm the youth pastor as well as the volunteer coordinator here at our church. However, today I've been given the opportunity to bring forth a teaching, which I'm so excited and honored to do. But before we do that, will you all please pray with me? Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this time and this opportunity that you've given us just to be together, Lord, with the busyness of life, uh, both with people uh, coming in here. I know we had a lot of things going on before this, and we have things to do after, but I pray, Jesus, that right now in this place, you help us to just be completely present and focused on you. Jesus, I pray that you grant me the grace to be able to bring forth your words and uh, allow each heart in this place to be open to you right now, Jesus, so that your will and your way may be done in all things, Jesus. Thank you for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, you know, words can never explain to you all how crazy it feels to have the opportunity to be up here right now. You see, I didn't come from a church-type community. And although I come from a very loving and a wonderful family, my background is full of addiction and the various types of brokenness that come with that type of upbringing. And because of the mindset that I had growing up, Jesus and his teachings were never really in my radar. See, I cared more about what Eminem and Lil Wayne and Jay-Z had to say about life and what they think it means to live a good one, if you know what I mean. But I think we can all agree that there's something about Jesus that is so fascinating, right? Regardless of where you're at in your faith journey, the words of Jesus are much different than the ways of uh, the world. That even people who don't subscribe to the Christian faith can find a great witness around not only Jesus' teachings, but the way that he interacted with people as well. And i got to tell you, from the jump, that's exactly what attracted me to Jesus. You see, even before I knew much about him, just hearing some of the things that he said and the way that uh, he talked with other people made me really curious about him. You see, I grew up under the thinking that says things like, take what you want, go and get your own at all costs, and don't ever let anybody push you around. But when we read the words of Jesus, we read things much differently, right? Jesus actually says things like, if someone makes you walk a mile, you willingly walk with them too. Or, if someone takes your coat, give them your shirt as well. Or the famous line that I'm sure many of us have heard here, if someone slaps you in the face, turn to them the other side as well. Can we just talk about for a second how wild that statement is, right? If someone slaps you in the face, turn to them the other side as well. That's like crazy. You know, I remember the first time I read that, I thought to myself, you know what, Jesus, if someone slaps me, I'm not even slapping them back. I'm throwing straight punches. You know what I mean? But there's something about Jesus that's so fascinating. You know, I think at this point in my life and seeing the way that the world functions, I've been particularly fascinated with Jesus' teachings on the concept of hardship and suffering. Because like everything, culture teaches us how to respond to suffering much differently than Jesus does. So really quick, Webster's Dictionary actually defines suffering as being a serious pain that someone feels in their body or in their mind. And now with this definition, we can recognize that Jesus actually teaches us to walk through suffering, right? To be present with it, to actively choose to deal with your suffering, while culture teaches us to ignore your suffering. Just pretend it's not there. Maybe find yourself a quick fix and a distraction. And now when I say quick fix and distraction, here's what I mean. A quick fix and a distraction is anything outside of God that we turn to to find comfort in suffering. I'll say that again, because this is a big point here. A quick fix and a distraction is anything outside of God that we turn to to find comfort in suffering. Now, there's so many things in life that we can turn to to bring us comfort outside of God, right? Actually, here's an example right here. My iPhone, right? Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I find myself having even the slightest inconvenience throughout my day, I'm much quicker to go into my phone and scrolling through it until my mind is totally numb than I am to ask God to be present with me within my pain. And now maybe your quick fix isn't your phone, but I'm sure you got one, right? If you're sitting in this place tonight, and I want you to go home, ask one of your loved ones what you spend most of your free time doing and see what they say. Maybe for some of us it's TV or binge watching Netflix or online shopping or overeating, whatever it might be. Quick fixes and distractions are everywhere. It's like you can't escape them. But here's the thing. And this is where the real issue lies that we're talking about today. Quick fixes aren't just our solution to the little daily inconveniences. 
Instead, this is the way culture slowly but surely trains us to deal with major sufferings and hardships as well, right? A house isn't built all together at once, it's built brick by brick, and that's the way these things work as well. Instead of asking God to show himself within our sufferings and trusting that he's loving enough to help us deal with them, we've instead been conditioned culturally to turn to quick fixes and distractions. And this is a problem, a big one. And we need to look to the life of Jesus to rewire our thinking on suffering and how to deal with it. And you know, the awesome thing about God is he isn't like some dictator or king or anything like that. When he tells us to do something, he doesn't do it from a distance, but instead he comes and he does it himself uh, in the form of his son, Jesus. And so I want to invite you right now to go ahead and sit back, get comfortable, and allow me to share a story with you all about how God teaches us to deal with suffering through the life of his son, Jesus. So this story takes place near the end of Jesus' time here on earth. We can read this story starting in Luke chapter 22. So it's at this point in Jesus' life that he's only days away from undergoing death. And not only death, but death on a cross, which is deemed one of the most sufferable ways of being killed in all of human history. You see, during a crucifixion, which is how Jesus was killed, an individual is taken and their hands are nailed down to the cross, And the weight of gravity on their body causes them to sink down so low that their lungs are basically crushed under their own body weight. And to make matters worse, if the process needed to be sped up, the executioners would actually break the legs of the individual on the cross, preventing them from being able to hold themselves up with their feet anymore and taking the pressure off their lungs. Right? This isn't a, a Sunday school type story. This is a brutal death. And Jesus knowing that this was the type of suffering that awaited him only hours away, was no doubt scared of the suffering that was to come. I mean, can you imagine? Dude, I get scared to go to the dentist. You know what I mean? But Jesus knew that the cross was in his very near future. And in the midst of the worrying that I'm sure Jesus was feeling, one evening he and his disciples stepped away from everything. They went to a secluded place, and Jesus prayed. And in this prayer... He said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of suffering from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Right? Jesus is saying, Father, if you can remove this suffering from me, please do it. Don't make me walk through this suffering. But if it is your will, take it away from me. Now, I want to ask, by a show of hands, how many of us have ever found ourselves having prayers like this during times of suffering? Yeah, I would assume almost all of us. Me too. And you know, obviously... Jesus had the same type of prayer. And I think sometimes we gloss over this part of Jesus' story. Oftentimes when we think about Jesus, we think about him as being the King of kings, the Lord of lords, how he overcame death and destroyed sin forever. Now obviously, Jesus did those things, but that's only part of his story. You see, when Jesus walked on this earth, he was a person much like you and me. Jesus Uh, had emotion. He had a family that he wanted to spend more time with. He had the ability to experience the feelings that we would feel if we knew we were about to die the death that he did. You see, Jesus suffered greatly. He felt despair. He felt brokenness. And he felt great agony over being called to suffer on the cross. And now our story continues. And it says, in being in agony, Jesus prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. My goodness, can you imagine that? Can you imagine experiencing such a great level of stress and anxiety that blood literally begins coming out of your pores? And now for anyone in here who might be thinking to yourself, yeah, that's probably just a metaphor or a figure of speech, whatever. No, there is actually a medical term for what Jesus was going through. And now for any doctor or nurse in here, please don't yell at me if I say this wrong. But Jesus was going through a rare medical condition called hematidrosis. Now this is defined as being a very rare condition that causes an individual to sweat blood from their skin due to physical or psychological stress. You see, Jesus, at this moment in time, was experiencing such great agony just thinking about his suffering, right? Just thinking about it. And so the story continues, and it says, While Jesus was still praying... The people who were sent to capture him arrived, and they took him to the courts. And in the court space, Jesus was mocked. The people placed a robe on him. They took thorns, and they rolled them in the shape of a crown, and they put it on his head to make fun of his kingship. 
He was physically assaulted. People spit on Jesus. They punched him in the face, and he was abandoned and left all alone by his best friends. And then lastly, he was placed on the cross to suffer and to die. And now you might be thinking to yourself, okay, Nathan, what does this have to do with our conversation on quick fixes and distractions? Well, let me tell you, Jesus had authority to bring forth a super quick fix. You see, the Bible makes it clear that at this point in Jesus' life, he had authority over both heaven and earth. And that means that with just a word, Jesus could have called forth legions of heaven's army to come down and shut everything down with just a word. Jesus could have said, you know what? This whole crucifixion thing, that's too much for me. I'm out of here. Guys, come get me. But instead of Jesus saying, this is too much for me to bear, i got to find a way out, he trusted in the Heavenly Father, and he said, if it is your will, let it be done. In the prayer that we just read, Jesus says, Father, if it is your will, remove this cup, take away this suffering, but if it is your will, then let it be done. You see, at this moment, Jesus teaches us how to respond to our suffering. He doesn't say, i got to find a way out of this. He says, God, if this is your will, if this suffering is what I need to go through for your will to be done in my life, then let it be done. I trust you. So instead of looking for a quick fix in a distraction, Jesus sat in his suffering. You see, Jesus could have found a quick way out, but instead he chose to be present in the midst of his pain. You know, a couple of years ago, I actually experienced something in my life that functioned as sort of a reality check as to the way that I handle suffering, and I'd like to share that with you all this morning. So shortly after high school, I moved into a two-bedroom trailer with my best friend named Michael. Now, Michael and I became best friends in middle school, and we remained really close friends all throughout our teenage years alongside our other best friends, Devin and Luke. Now, I experienced so much of my life alongside of these three, but as close as we all were to each other, we had a particularly close bond to Michael, especially. Michael's the one on the far left side there. Uh, Michael was the glue that held all of us together. We thought about him as being the love that made the four of us inseparable. And so when Michael and I decided to live in the same place together after high school, it was awesome, right? Got to live with my best friend. We got to party, live life however we wanted, all of that. We didn't have any concerns or worries about our future. We were just living in the moment. And now I don't want to take too much time on this right now, but I'll tell you that in the midst of living like that, I recognized that no matter what I did, no matter how much fun I had, my heart was empty. And over time, the emptiness in my heart grew bigger and bigger until one day, out of total desperation, I had no idea what I was doing, but I asked Jesus to be present with me in my life. And I'm telling you, at that moment, everything completely changed. And so I nervously shared my experience with Michael one evening, kind of worried about how he was going to respond. But he actually told me that he'd been feeling the same way. And so he and I prayed together, and God changed his heart as well shortly after. And so God changed us, and we began reading Scripture together like every night, and then we grew into our faith, and about a year after that, we were both baptized with each other. Um, and then after baptism, I felt called into ministry, so I moved to Chicago to study in seminary school. Michael moved to Ohio to continue on with his life as well. However, through all these changes, we remained especially close. Then about four years into my time in Chicago and in seminary school, something happened that has changed my life forever. I was sitting home one evening, it was in the middle of December, and I received a phone call. Now, it was really late when I received this call, so I kind of knew right off the bat that something was going on. It was actually one of Michael's loved ones calling me to tell me that he left the house a few hours ago, and they hadn't heard from him or seen him in a while, and they were wondering if I talked to him. Now, I hadn't at this point, so I tried to give him a call, but he didn't answer. Then about an hour after the first call, I received another call. And as soon as I answered the phone, I could just feel that something was really off. And before the person on the other line could even say a word, I could just feel a really heavy and dark emotion. And I asked the person on the other line over and over again what was going on, and finally they pushed through and they told me that Michael was found in his car a few miles away from their home. He actually committed suicide in a parking lot that evening. And at that moment, nothing felt real. I felt like I was living in a nightmare. And then as it felt like time was standing still, I called my mom and I called my sister, and then our best friend Devin called me, and he and I just sat on the phone together and cried for what felt like a really long time. 
And for anyone here who's ever experienced the loss of a loved one to suicide, we know that these feelings can carry on with us for many, many years. But luckily, and I mean truly thank God that I had a relationship with Jesus at this point in my life. Because if I didn't, there is no way that I would have gotten through it. But the fact is, is sometimes even when we have Jesus, when we call ourselves Christians, when we truly know Christ, we're still quick to gravitate towards those quick fixes and distractions. And I found myself doing exactly that. You know, I was nearing the end of seminary school. I was only months away from receiving my master's degree in biblical studies. I knew all the promises that we can find in Jesus and passages that say things like, Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Or, Do not be discouraged, for I, the Lord, will be with you wherever you go. And passages like Psalm 46.1 that says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. You see, I knew those verses But still, my heart would frequently gravitate towards quick fixes and distractions. And now, if I'm being honest with you guys right now in this place, for me, one of those distractions at the time was alcohol. Instead of surrendering my hurt and my pain over to Jesus, I tried to escape my thoughts by diluting them with alcohol. And this was my struggle for much of the time that followed Michael's passing. Until one day, Michael's sister called me and she asked if I'd be willing to speak at a service remembering Michael. And immediately, the thought that passed through my mind was, well, there is no way I can be present with Michael's loved ones or his family if I haven't first dealt with the hurt that's going on in my own head. And so I asked his sister just to give me a little bit of time to think about her request and to pray it over. And in my prayer, I was reminded of my love for Michael and his family. And with God's help, I chose to speak at his service. But leading up to that, there was a lot of suffering that I had to choose to deal with. When all I wanted to do was to distract myself, I had to force myself to sit on my couch and to think about Michael and the many years that he and I spent with each other. I had to force myself, just like Jesus teaches us, to choose to deal with my suffering. You know, I tell you this story and I share this part of myself with you all today because I see this happening in the life of other people time and time again. When we look around the world, we almost never see people suffering like Jesus, but instead we see people choosing to go to quick fixes and distractions. Rather, it's people using quick relationships to mask the hurt of divorce, or young people turning to broken relationships to help cover up a deep need that they have to feel seen, or it's people turning to drugs and alcohol to numb themselves from the many pains of this life. You see, church, there are constant examples of what we're talking about today all over the world. And maybe some of you in here are feeling some of these things right now. And the fact is, we will all suffer in this life, right? The Bible actually tells us that. Jesus says to one of or to his disciples in one of their last conversations, he says, in this life, you will suffer. That means everyone in this room right now has felt or is currently feeling great suffering. But there's good news for those of us who follow Jesus. Because we can find complete comfort in Christ. You see, because Jesus knows what true suffering feels like because He came and went went on to the cross, He walks with us in the midst of our own suffering. Scripture actually tells us in Psalm 23, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. That means that in the midst of our suffering, we can take comfort in knowing that Christ is with us. So Jesus tells us that even if your suffering makes you feel like you're walking into death, I'm walking with you. Do you trust me? Are you going to look for a quick way out? You see, we need to rewire our thinking on suffering and look to Jesus, just like he looked to the Father as he was walking towards the cross. This is what it means to suffer like Jesus. We trust that God is moving in our suffering, and we recognize that any quick fix or distraction may prevent God from doing what He's doing in our lives. And you know, I think one of the biggest teachings that Jesus gives us on suffering is that when we choose to give God our pain, He not only uses it for our sake, but He uses it to grow those around us as well. Because we know how the story of Jesus ends, right? Jesus chooses to take on death to take on the cross, and to take on suffering for us. God, in Christ, chose to enter into complete suffering 
because he knew that it would bring life to all of creation who would call on his name. Jesus chose to suffer for others. This is a big teaching and a big thing to chew on, but I believe fully that this is actually the true calling of a Christian. We don't turn to quick fixes and distractions in times of suffering, but we turn to Jesus believing that he alone is going to use our suffering for the good of our lives and for the good in the life of other people as well. You know, I was reminded of this fact shortly after uh, Michael's funeral settled and everything was kind of over. Michael and my best friend Devin and Brianna started to talk about their own struggles, about how they felt broken after losing Michael. And Devin one day texted me, and he asked me, how do you keep from losing hope? And I told him that Jesus was the only way that I was getting through it. And now, I wasn't trying to evangelize or anything like that by any means. I was truly just speaking from the heart. But it reminded me of one of the conversations that I had with Michael after he and I became Christians. Michael and I would talk for hours about how badly we wanted to see the joy of Christ in the life of our friends and our families. And more than anything, Michael wanted to see our community and our people find Jesus. Now, as I stand up here today, I'm overwhelmed to come to this church, this church where my mother, my sister, my family, Michael's family, and our best friends, Devin and Bree, all come and they place their hope in Jesus. And as I stand up here today, I am overwhelmed to look out and to see my little sister and my, and my mom sitting out here right now. And I had nothing to do with this. But all I did was I chose to suffer like Jesus did. And I didn't turn to any quick fixes and distractions. And here's the main part. I actually told other people that Jesus is the only answer to their suffering. And so I say the same thing to anyone in here right now. If you're hurting, if you're carrying a burden that has you feeling weighed down and broken, turn to Jesus. You are never too far and you're never too messy for Christ to be with you. Jesus is with you in your suffering, and all you need to do is call out to Him, and He will be with you. And so if you're in this place right now, and you're saying to yourself, you know what, I've tried every quick fix, I've tried every distraction, and nothing's working. The suffering and the pain is still in my life. Jesus, I need your help. So if you're in here and you're feeling that way right now, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And now this isn't a prayer that you're going to say on your own, but we're actually going to say this together. And so if there's anyone in here who's never asked Jesus to be in your life, we're going to do that together right now. And so if you're done looking to quick fixes and distractions, and you're ready to experience true comfort in Jesus, I invite you to repeat this after me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, please repeat after me. Jesus, forgive me. Make me brand new. I believe you died and rose again so I could live with you. Fill me with your spirit so I could know you, serve you, and follow you for the rest of my life. My life is not my own. Today I give it to you. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, in the midst of our suffering, Jesus is with us. And in the midst of your suffering, all you need to do is call out to the name of Christ, and he will bring you true comfort. And now it's at this time, I want to ask that our prayer people will go ahead and come forward. We're going to have someone standing right down here and someone up top. And if there's anyone in here who's going through something right now, and you need to talk to somebody, and you need to fill the community of prayer, I invite you to please come forward. We would love to pray for you. And if anyone uh, said that prayer for the first time, we ask that you please fill out your connect card and drop in the boxes on your way out because we as a church would love to connect with you. Now it's at this time I ask that everyone will please stand and receive this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Go from this place and know that you are loved. Thank you.